Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. And I appreciate y'all being here. We're gonna do something different today, no intro for this. I'm pretty much just gonna break down the comic book, The Lethal Protector, uh, which came out in the 90s and it was kind of Venom's first, you know, adventure into a solo story universe uh, because before that he was pretty much only appearing in spider-man comics and, and a few other little marvel comics and lethal protector written by david michelini and art by mark bagley in the first couple issues and then i think the last three issues were like ron Lim and al milgram or something like working together on breakdowns and finishes so uh it's it's a pretty good story it's six issues long so we're going to get into it right now so the main reason I want to talk about this comic book series is because the film, the upcoming Ruben Fleischer Venom movie with Tom Hardy and Michelle Williams, it actually pulls a lot, or they said in it recently at Brazil Comic Con or the Comic Con experience in Brazil, that uh, that it pulls a lot from the Lethal Protector comic book series. And I find that very interesting because uh, this series actually is is heavily, it has Spider-Man in it. Like he plays a pretty big part in the story, not a part that you know is exclusive to Spider-Man. Like you could easily pull Spider-Man out and put someone else kind of in that position and they may do that for the movie uh, but uh, but still it, it's a storyline uh, that is that has Spider-Man in it and it, the reason for Spider-Man being in this is because he's the one person that was 100% sure besides like maybe Mary Jane and Black Cat who were like affected by Venom as well but he's 100% like his arch enemy and he was like you know Venom's a bad guy that's just how it is the world's black and white Venom's a bad guy and then in this storyline it's Venom convincing Spider-Man that he can do good and that he's not a threat Spider-Man needs to worry about and that they can go their separate ways and that's what's that's like the key point of this story because the script in this comic is very all over the place it's very unfocused it throws in it crams in things that are like oh well let's put a human moment here but it doesn't it interrupts the flow of the dumb action and then you get into that moment and then the, then the dumb action comes back and you're like okay and a lot of the action isn't really done well and a lot of the characters aren't really set up very well uh, and again these are just my opinions on it uh, but it is still kind of a fun read actually if you if you're out there and you want to pick it up I highly recommend it because like I said it is a pivotal point in the Venom character's history. And it's one that if you're a Venom fan, you have to read, in my opinion. I mean, there's just no way around it. It's it's weird, it's goofy, it's silly, it has a lot of just ideas, put it, a lot of ideas. Like, there's just a lot of story in this thing that is unnecessary, maybe, but it makes the book interesting. Like, in the beginning, it's pretty much like Venom is, you know, he's left New York, he's decided to separate from Spider-Man, promised not to kill him, he's going back to San Francisco. What we learn is that Eddie Brock is actually from the San Francisco area. His dad, Carl, actually lives out there, and Spider-Man, you know, once he hears that Venom is, like, you know, getting into altercations out in San Francisco, he decides to take a trip uh, and fly out there, and he's basically, I think, doing it under the skies of Peter Parker, doing a, a, a journalistic assignment for the Daily Bugle or something. So he's going out there to kind of investigate Venom, pretty much. Um, but he's doing it under like a, a lie, like saying, like, oh, I got to go out there for like an assignment. Um, and so, so Peter like leaves and goes out there, out to San Francisco. And while he's out there, he's like interviewing like Carl, you know, who's Eddie Brock's father. Carl won't give him anything. So then he talks to this lady named something Dempsey. And she's like the the housemaid or whatever of the, the the Brock family, and she tells Eddie Brock's backstory, which is pretty much her only purpose in the storyline. And the Carl thing, that's they literally don't come back in the story at all. Uh, so again, just normally when you set something up, you pay it off in your story. And this was like set up, set up, and then like no payoff. And it was literally just a way for David Michelini to squeeze in the backstory of Eddie Brock of how he started out uh, like in his early teens, maybe like or maybe like between ten and thirteen. He was a, a nerdy kid, skinny, nerdy kid, and that didn't impress his father. So when he was like in his high school years, Eddie Brock started to work out and play sports. And he was hoping trophies, like bringing home trophies and stuff, like bringing home A's, straight A's didn't impress his dad. So then he's like, all right, I'm going to bring home trophies. And uh, and those didn't impress his father. And then after Watergate, like actually Eddie's reading a newspaper about Watergate, that inspires him to go be a journalist and so he's like all right i'm going to go work for this company called the daily globe in new york city and uh, and i'm going to pursue that and pursue journalism and maybe exposing the truth about things and, and making a difference in the world maybe that will impress my father and then of course we know what happened his his story is that he was following the sin eater case and he ended up interviewing the wrong person someone who claimed to be the sin eater and then eddie brock was exposed for being a hoax which was the last straw whatever chip his father had on his shoulder about not accepting his son 
uh, that was finally like fell off and broke be after after Eddie was revealed to be like a fraud and uh, and so they just just you know didn't communicate anymore. Uh, so even in the storyline where Venom comes back to San Francisco, he doesn't seek out his father. He doesn't seek out approval. There's no payoff to that setup of the story. Uh, none of that. Like all this stuff is just forgotten uh, mostly over time. And, uh, and it's, it's frustrating because you're reading this book and you're like, wow, these are great setups in the first two issues. And then none of it pays off. And, uh, and then there's like so many villains thrown in in this. There's, uh, they have uh, this guy named uh, Roland Treese. And he's like the main bad guy. And he uh, is running this um, like uh, a project that is like supposed to help people. It's like a charity project. And they're kind of like vague on what it really is because it doesn't matter. The truth is, is back in 1906, there was a big earthquake in San Francisco. A bunch of the old city fell underground. And then like the, the way the earth like, you know, shifted and stuff. And it cr crumbled like a city block of buildings like underground. And then like new area, new land was put over it to kind of cover it up, I guess. Uh, so now the homeless have like wandered down there. They found it like a couple years prior to the story. And then a bunch of homeless people started living there because they're like, hey, there's buildings here and somewhat working electricity so um but we like light torches and stuff so it's a kind of villagey and old school too and they're like underground and they just found a place to live and so they're down there and eddie ends up uh getting in the altercation with something that treases like funding which is the life foundation and these like things called the diggers and the diggers are these two giant mechs that are like you know looking for this gold we find out later that it's gold that trees is looking for that was that fell under there in 1906 and he's been ever in you know, his whole life he's been, he's like an adventurer in a way he's but just like a, a fat cat you know financial guy uh, so he doesn't have like he's not like the 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 swashbuckling type He's more of like a business guy. And so he's like, all right, I'm going to fund this project to look for this gold. And that's what he's doing. But meanwhile, Venom keeps interfering uh, unknowingly. And he has to uh, go to this company called the Life Foundation to uh, to hire them to keep Venom off his back so that he could like, you know, go through with this plan and become rich or whatever. And uh, it's just a really goofy story. And it's so complicated for no reason and then meanwhile the life foundation the reason they're interested in venom is because they actually studied venom they've been following him for years and they know about carnage and that carnage is an offspring of venom so during doing some kind of distant study i guess because i don't think they ever got a sample of venom uh they figured out that venom has five more seeds in him so he could birth five more symbiotes and so the Life Foundation, for whatever reason, wants to, I guess just for control, like they want to up their 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 military presence, I guess, um, which is weird. Like they're called the Life Foundation and they just like have armored guards and they have these guys that are called the Jury, which are like low rent Iron Man. And I actually had to write down their names because they're so 90s cheesy. It's funny. But their backstory is really interesting. Um, in a single issue book called Venom Death Trap colon the vault or I think maybe it was just called death trap the vault or something like that uh but it was a storyline where venom after his encounters with spider-man was put in a, a cell called the the, uh, the vault and it was like a, a high ranking prison for super powered people and the first thing when venom is like able to rejoin with the symbiote he breaks out of that vault and he's obviously going off to kill Spider-Man. And so he's like, all right, I got to bust out of here. And he ends up killing a guard. And the guard is just like a random guy he kills. Well, in this book, we learned that that guard had a name. Obviously, he had a name. His name was Hugh Taylor. And his dad is uh, one of the people working with and, and operating the jury in the, the Life Foundation company. So there's like some real drama there. It's like, hey, something that happened in a random comic book like a couple years ago is now paying off and it's like all right you you killed my son and ever since then i've been obsessed with you and i have these guys who are like in these low rent iron man armor they have repulsor rays i know they can hurt you they can emit sound that hurts the symbiote one of the guys shoots fire another guy shoots laser beams like they all have things there's five of them and they can all weaken venom and so there's screech ram shot sentry firearm and bomb blast and uh, and they all are this group called the century uh, the, the the group called the jury and they're basically judge jury and executioner like judge dread they're coming to take down venom and all five of them are guards from the vault and military men that used to work with hugh taylor so they all lost their friend and now they want revenge on venom and i'm like that's really interesting that's a story in and of itself but nope it's only like done in like five pages <laughs> in this really crammed mini series so anyway i just thought that was deeply fascinating i was like that's a great story to tell and of course it's crammed into this big gold trying to find gold get rich storyline that just doesn't make any sense uh but to me 
this was great. And then even to the point where Venom doesn't even want to hurt the jury or or Mr. Taylor. Like, he doesn't want to hurt them. He, he's like, their anger is justified. I, I didn't want to kill the kid, uh, the security guard. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to kill Spider-Man. And he stood in my way and I reacted and, you know, and he died. And he's like, so I was like, that's real human emotion in there. I, I dig deeper. I want that. You know, like, I don't want every comic book to be like an Academy Award winning level writing, but I do want like basic storytelling in there. And this was like, oh, that's so great and rich and beautiful. And then it's all gone and like really quickly. But also like who's working with Treese, there's a guy named uh, Crane, there's another guy named Jenkins and a guy named Cooper Smith. And they they all have just like one or two scenes each. But Crane actually has like three or four scenes, I think. And he's got a shaved head and he's wearing like a black coat. And it instantly made me think of Scott Hayes, who was like tasering um, Eddie Brock uh, in the one of the footage we saw recently. Uh, Scott Hayes, who was rumored to be in the movie, turns out he is in the movie. He's got a shaved head and he's got a black coat. And I'm like, hey, that's exactly like this Crane dude, like just some random throwaway thug in this in this comic book. He, so I don't know if he's playing Crane or if the, he's just based off Crane or just coincidentally has a similar look to him. But shaved head, black coat, pretty similar. Uh, and Crane works with this guy named Roland Treese. And uh, so Roland Treese trying to get his gold and Crane is like one of his henchmen to try to keep, um, you know, Eddie, Eddie Brock away. And there's also James and Cooper Smith are other henchmen. So I don't know if one of them is going to be played by Woody Harrelson because he's rumored to play a henchman right now. Um, so I don't know. Or if he'll play like a jury member henchman type. Um, I'm clearly they're not going to do the Iron Man low rent Iron Man armor for this movie. I don't think they have the budget for it, but it would be still cool to see like a bunch of setup. By the way, speaking of setup and payoff, this book sets up um, these five jury members to be the ones to fight Venom, and they give them great background into why they should fight Venom, which is they lost their friend, he died, and Venom killed him. So these five guys you would think would be prime candidates for the five symbiote seeds that Venom apparently has in them, and I thought that's where they were going with the story was hey. You five are signing up, you know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make you guys the new Venoms. Like, we'll kill this Venom, we'll take his seeds, and we'll make you guys the new Venom, and you'll work for us. And we'll control these symbiotes, and we'll use them to protect America or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's a great setup. And then at the end, it was just four random people, or five random people, like two girls and three guys that we never meet that get chosen to be the new symbiotes. And we don't even, they only fight for like an issue and then they're wiped out. They're like, Eddie Brock kill, like, kills the symbiotes. He leaves the humans alive, but he kills the symbiotes. And you're just like, oh my goodness. Like, it's just so random and thrown in and, and just kind of bad in a lot of ways. But it works because the, the, the book feels like a mess, but but like an enjoyable mess. Like each issue feels like it's setting up a completely different story that maybe D David Michelini meant to write later on. And it's like, no, dude, you should have just focused. Like, that's a lot of times what writers do in movies and comic books. They want to do this long form storytelling. And it's like, there's no guarantee that you're going to be on this book, writing this character in like three months. Like there's no guarantee of that. Uh, and so you need to treat it like this is your one chance at telling a story. Even if it's David Michelini who had been writing, writing Spider-Man for years, even if he was pretty sure like, ah, I'm going to be writing this book for a while and I'm going to write this character for a while, uh, or I'll write this miniseries now and I'll pay it off in another thing. It's like, no, you, that's not good. Like, that's not how, at least how I would approach something like that. And I don't think that's the responsible way to approach something like that. You should, as a writer, focus on the story you're trying to tell. Uh, so this book is, like I said, it's kind of an all over the place mess, uh, but I really enjoyed rereading it. It was fun. It brought back a lot of memories and there's great character moments in it. Uh, the, the best being, and I'll, I'll wrap this up here. The best being is the ending where Eddie Brock convinces Spider-Man that he's actually a hero. So Eddie is looking for acceptance. You know, he always has been. That's the, something they set up in the story is that he's looking for acceptance from his father and he never gets it. And then he was, you know, looking for acceptance in New York and uh, everyone rejected him after the Sin Eater story. So now he's back home and he's again looking for acceptance. He meets these homeless people and some of them are willing to take him in. They're like, hey, we want you to be a part of our society and maybe protect us because we're a bunch of homeless people. We don't have a lot of strength. We don't get a lot of food and uh, and, and, and we're getting attacked by this this tree sky and his his two digger robot things. So like we, we just need protection. And, uh, you know, and he's like, uh, yeah, I want to. I, I The fact that you want me makes me want to do it because nobody wants me like I, i'm a monster everybody hates looking at me and, and hates the person inside as well as the alien symbiote on me uh but you are accepting me and so i want to protect you even more and so it's all about loyalty and, and how loyal eddie can be uh maybe to a fault but still loyal and uh and it was really neat to see at the end of the story this big payoff where 
the homeless people are in jeopardy. There's a bomb that's going to go off. It's going to cave in the ground that was built over the old city. And it's going to cave in and just basically crush a bunch of people, kids included. And Eddie Brock meets this woman named Elizabeth who has a little boy. And he's like, I'm, I just want to make sure no one hurts these people, um, even though some of them don't like me because they had a council meeting of the homeless people. And they're like, we don't want Venom here. They voted him out. So he gets rejected. So he goes out and he's like not part of them anymore, but he's trying to win them over like he always does, like with his father and everything. He's like, he doesn't give up. He's like, I, someone has to accept me eventually. So I'm going to go fight this tree sky and, and, and protect these people. And maybe then they'll accept me back in. So when he goes to stop the bomb, uh, it's surrounded by fire and Treese is inside a building and he's protected by the fire because the, the fire is a weakness of Venoms. And, and Spider-Man can't, he's, Spider-Man's fighting the mechs. So Spider-Man's like, look, you go stop Treese. I'll fight these guys and deal with these guys. Uh, so Venom gets the chance to be the hero. Uh, and again, that, that Spider-Man wants to believe he might be. And so Spider-Man's given him his chance to do it. So Venom goes over and he pulls the symbiote, stretches it out through the fire. The suit is screaming like crazy. And it's like, ah, you know, and he's like, I know you're in pain. I'm sorry. He's like, but we have to do this. We have to do the right thing for once. And the suit goes into the building, grabs trees and pulls him out. Um, uh, as the fire encompasses it and the and they the explosions don't go off like i think venom stops the explosion or it's like a button he has to press and venom pulls him away before he presses the button and uh, and then so just the building burns and nothing crumbles no one dies and he pulls trees out and trees is alive and he leaves trees to answer for his crimes and right there in front of spider-man shows he was willing to make a sacrifice in front of the homeless people who came out and saw this happen um he was willing to make a sacrifice he saved the day and he didn't kill the bad guy he let he's gonna let the justice system take take uh you know take over and he's gonna give that a shot he, you know he's like hey you know, if you get out of jail, I'll kill you then. But for now, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to trust in, you know, Spider-Man's way and, and, and the way people, I'm going to deviate from expectations. Everyone thinks I'm going to be the bad guy here. Um, I'm not going to be the bad guy, you know, and uh, kind of, I'm not like as cheesy as the Daredevil movie did, um, but, but still like kind of similar. So Eddie Brock, you know, at the end of the book saves the day making a real sacrifice and him and the suit wander off. And then they end up going back into the underground society and the homeless people accept them. And he's like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll hang out here and I'll protect you guys. And then of course, the next miniseries that comes out called Funeral Pyre doesn't touch on that, written by a different writer. David Michelini doesn't get his hands on Venom for a couple years after this. Um, and that story's never really paid off. So, so it's just kind of this random uh, of series of events that happened to Venom all thrown together in this one miniseries. Uh, but that's apparently the movie's going to pull from that. So what I find interesting is that the comic features a lot of Spider-Man. Spider-Man's not going to be in the movie. Uh, it tells a little bit about Eddie's background, which is great because that could be in the movie. Uh, Anne Weying, uh, uh, Venom's ex-wife, she's not in this storyline but she could easily be any of these characters. She could even be the Spider-Man character because you have, Spider-Man's basically doing detective work trying to figure out what's going on with Eddie and everything like that. You could even have her play that role because I'm going to assume maybe they're not married in this movie. Maybe this is them meeting uh, and then kind of rearranging the timeline a little bit. Or maybe they were married and they're divorced and, and now she notices something's going on with Eddie and she's trying to figure out what's going on because uh, I think in the movie she plays like a lawyer or something. So... That's all great. Like, I mean, so there's things in this storyline that I'm like, oh, I hope they pull this and I hope they pull this because it's real human emotion. And, oh, Eddie Brock responsible for killing someone. Maybe in this movie he'll kill somebody and, and then has to pay for that sin in the next movie or whatever. You know, like, I just I just like things like that that ha that pull real emotion out of stuff. Um, so, but then also I'm, I'm hoping what they don't do in this movie is like the Life Foundation is in the movie. In the comic, they're just there for revenge, but also they want to make their own symbiotes and control their own symbiotes. If they do that in this movie, I hope it's just carnage. I hope it's not the five, because these five villains were so uninteresting. They show up for like a half an issue and then they get blasted down by Venom. I mean, like the girl symbiote one, the red, yellow one, she shows up first and she gets, uh, you know, disappears, like runs away. And then she, the next issue, they all five fight Venom and he takes them out like that uh for the most part so it to me i hope they don't do, pull from that at all uh but the other storyline that the movie pulls from is called planet of the symbiotes and that is definitely something we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode again when it's a slow news day because i recorded a couple i'm recording a couple of these in advance and i don't know when i'll post them uh, but we just heard the Anne Weighing news today, so I made that video already, and then we have this video here, that's why I'm in the same shirt, 
Uh, but I'll have other videos that I've already pre-recorded with Planet Symbiotes and other stuff I talked about that will be coming up in future episodes. So make sure you subscribe to this channel. I'll go over everything Venom related from the comics to the movies, cartoons, everything in between. Uh, anytime actors do interviews, I'll try to cover everything I can for you guys to bring you the news of this upcoming movie that I am very excited about. Uh, at first, I was so against this movie. As you guys know from previous videos, I was like, Venom without Spider-Man? How's this going to work? But as we get closer to it, as I'm learning more about it, I'm intrigued, to say the least. Not doesn't mean it's going to be great. doesn't mean I'm going to love it. But I'm intrigued, and I want to go on this journey with you guys. So hopefully you stick around for that. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you all in the future. Peace.